Well, welcome to this service of witness to the resurrection for Luke Fant. Uh, I am his son, Franklin, and I have uh, two special people uh, helping me with this service this afternoon. Luke's granddaughter, Mary Harley Fant, will sing an anthem during the service, and I'm especially grateful for the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Douglas Key. Um, Douglas, I'm grateful for your friendship and your support surrounding my father's death and for your help in putting the service together, especially uh, this video recording uh, that you're helping us make. We, we had a number of people who wanted to be here today. Of course, we're just with family today, uh, but a number of people said they would, wanted to be here and would like to see it, and so we have decided to record this, and we'll, this will be posted on Shandon's uh, YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Let us begin by hearing these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Because I live, you also will live. Let us pray. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, you formed us from the dust of the earth, and by your breath you gave us life. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, you tasted death for all humanity, and by rising from the grave, you opened the way to eternal life. We praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, you are the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope. We worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we have been gathered here in this place today by Luke's love for us and by our love for him. We're here because we knew him to be steadfast and reliable and loyal. He was a rock. Of all of the people I've known in my life, his integrity is the most unimpeachable of those that I can think of. He had high standards for those he loved, but his heart was filled with mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. He was wise and was a source of good counsel to his children and his grandchildren, whom he loved with his whole heart. Even those of us who were only honorary fans knew that he loved us and was proud of our accomplishments and celebrated with us and forgave us our failures and wanted only the very best for us. He was a devoted husband and father and grandfather. He was uncommonly generous to everyone. Unless he was in the back seat with the map and the driver made a wrong turn. But that, as they say, is a story for another time. We are here today to celebrate and give thanks for this good life that blessed our lives and the lives of countless other family and friends and neighbors and co-workers and acquaintances in ways beyond number. We're here because we loved him and he loved us, a love to which our grief bears witness. He will be missed. He still had songs to sing and Clemson football games to watch and apparently grass to cut. <laughs> Even though our hearts are comforted by our knowledge that for him the race is run, his suffering of these past months is over and complete and his well-earned rest has been won. For those who loved him most, sadness and sorrow are a necessary part of this day of thanksgiving and celebration. And so it is here in the valley of the shadow of death that we turn our ears and our hearts to the words of Holy Scripture, to hear again the ancient promises of our faith where our true comfort and our true peace can be found. In Scripture, we are assured that the Lord reigns over heaven and earth, that his sovereign love goes before us and follows after us and is ever weaving us into his good purposes of justice and peace all the days of our lives. Here, God reminds us that there is no power in all the world that can rival God's power to love us, to care for us, to sustain us through any difficulty or trial, any grief or pain or loss, regardless of the sorrow and suffering that visit us, necessarily so, in this life. 
God is never far from us. Sadness and grief cannot remove us from the hope and consolation of God's loving presence. So we turn to Scripture to hear those things and also to be confirmed again that this life is not all there is for us, but there is life beyond this life. We are promised an eternal home with God where suffering and sorrow and struggle have no place and all the people in this part of the wall will be back together again. Hearing again these promises, our hearts are freed to remember Luke's good and faithful life with thanksgiving and gratitude, confident that he now rests with the God who claimed him at the beginning, loved him throughout, even and especially to the end. So incline your hearts and minds to these words from Job, words of confident assurance and promise that redemption belongs to the faithful and that God's sure and certain presence awaits those who fear him. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead, they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side. And my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. Our second Old Testament reading is from Psalm 150, Luke's favorite psalm, because Luke lived to praise God. When he wasn't singing something, he was whistling something. Luke knew that praise is a human privilege not to be taken for granted. We live to glorify the God who made us and rescues us and loves us still. He was a musician who raised musicians because music transcends words and is the language of praise. So Psalm 150, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his surpassing greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with clanging cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to the the reading and hearing of it to our comfort and our strength and our everlasting consolation this day and forever. Amen. When a peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. He lives, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not the part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well.
sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well. Well, our, our reading from the Gospels comes from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 27. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Here ends our gospel reading. Our final reading comes from the second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Here ends our reading. Well, before I begin our meditation on Scripture, I, I want to take a moment to express my family's gratitude to all the wonderful cards and phone calls and emails that uh, caring folks have sent our way over the last few days. We have been truly touched by the outpouring and the attention, the outpouring of attention that we have received from so many people and all of the kind things that People that, that folks have shared uh, about my father. You know, during a time when the coronavirus pandemic uh, keeps us all apart, I want you all to know, anyone watching this, that your love and prayers have nevertheless been felt and your thoughtful words have come through loud and clear. Thank you so much. Well, my father Luke did something that few people do anymore in this world. He 
spent his entire career working for a single employer. He was a traffic engineer for the Department of Transportation. And this was not just a job for him. He, he did this work with a true sense of calling. He believed that he was serving the people of his state by working to ensure that roadways would be safe and efficient. And he knew that the work that he did at, at the uh, what we used to call the highway department, he knew the work that he did on these projects would directly impact the, the number of accidents and the number of deaths even that would occur on these roadways. And he knew that the work that he did would impact whether the traffic went smoothly or whether there would be lots of congestion. And so he took that, he took that very seriously as a calling, really. And I remember being a high school junior or senior and pondering a career and a college major and he told me, we were out in the backyard, and he said that he really thought that as I was pondering my career, I should be thinking about what kind of contribution I wanted to make to society through my work. He said that was something that had been very important to him, to have real meaning every day when he went to work, that his work had real meaning. He was very proud of being an engineer. He, he liked to analyze a problem and find an efficient, clever solution. And, of course, he was very proud of being a tiger, a Clemson tiger. More importantly, my father was a man who loved his family, and his family loved him back. He clearly demonstrated across the many decades that, that we knew him. He demonstrated that one of his chief concerns in life, one of his, the chief purposes of his life, was to be a committed husband to my mother Mary, to be a committed father to my brother Andrew and me. Later on, he was a loving father-in-law to Christy, whom he absolutely adored and to whom he was always supportive and positive. Now, my father viewed family obligations as a duty, a duty to us and a duty to God, but at the same time, that didn't mean it wasn't also a source of great pleasure. He loved being a family man. You know, family, for him, family obligations were not just something one ought to do or had to do. They were, it was something that you got to do. So when grandchildren Mayor Harley, Luke, and Tate came along, he embraced grandfatherhood with gusto. He enjoyed them so much and took so much pride in each one of them. And then two and a half years ago, he was so excited when little James, his great-grandson, came into the world, and he never missed an opportunity to see him. Every Sunday after worship, once worship was over, he would make a beeline from the sanctuary to the nursery so he could get a, a peek at James just for a couple of minutes before going home. You know, as his son, I can say that if I ever needed anything or wanted his attention, he would do his best to be available. And I never had any doubt whatsoever of his unconditional love. He showed his love to me in many ways, but, you know, I think one of the most significant was just that he spent time, spent time with me. We played lots of ball in the yard together. He also gave me some good strategies for life, and I don't, I don't think I've hardly ever shared this with anybody. But to give an example of a life lesson, when I was in fifth grade, I, I was not happy with the fact that I wasn't getting more playing time on my baseball team. But my, my father, of course, refused to be one of those parents that, that pleads for their children to the coach to and wines to give their child more playing time. No, he, he sat me down and told me to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and to write out all the arguments that I needed to make about why I should be playing more. And then once I had that stuff on paper, he told me to call the coach and have a conversation with him, and I did it. And, you know, I still do that to this day. If I have a, a complicated or a, or a sensitive conversation I need to have over the phone, I'll outline phrases I want to use, questions I want to ask, and I have that ready to guide me in the conversation. Our passage from 2 Timothy came to mind as I was reflecting on my father's life, especially his last month with us. Now, the letter is written by the, by the Apostle Paul to the Apostle Timothy. Timothy. Paul is Timothy's mentor in the faith in general, but he is also Timothy's mentor in what we would now, nowadays call the ordained ministry. This letter is written by an older man who feels himself approaching the end of his life, but this man still has sound advice for the younger fellow, and he, he still has things to teach him. He still has an example to set for him. My father was not an apostle like Paul, but he was definitely a servant of the Lord. 
He loved Shandon Presbyterian Church, and he was a fixture in the Shandon Choir for close to 60 years, if not more. He loved music, as Douglas mentioned, and uh, he even busted out in, in song about three times during that last month in the hospital bed. Uh, sometimes we were with him, sometimes we'd hear him from the other end of the house. He served on the diaconate at Shandon. He served multiple terms as an elder, which included serving as clerk of session. He, he led and served on various commi committees over the years, and most recently he served on the Shandon Centennial Committee. And of course, you think about all that, what that means for us as a family, of, well, with, of course, with the necessary support and partnership of my mother, that means we were at the church whenever the doors were open, just like the keys. Um, my father made it clear to me also that being a follower of Jesus included being a generous steward of one's financial resources. He set a good example for me of being a generous giver. So a bit like what Paul did for Timothy, I feel like my father set an example for me, showing me that the life of Christian discipleship was a matter of being all in. When I hear Paul telling Timothy to carry out his ministry fully, I think about the example my father set in carrying out his ministry as a disciple of Jesus. Paul winds up this passage with a declaration that his life in this world is soon to be over. He has fought the good fight, he's finished the race and kept the faith. That truth about fighting forward, finishing well, and keeping the faith was also on prominent display during the last month of my father's life. His health had been in serious decline for many months prior to his being diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What had seemed perhaps to be just old age setting in was finally revealed as cancer. And by the time he was diagnosed, he was too weak for chemo. When my mother and I sat down with him to tell him he would be going straight to hospice care and there would be no treatment, he took it in stride and showed little or no emotional response. And so not entirely clear what was go going on inside his heart and mind, I, I, I reached out and put my hand on his arm and I said, well, Daddy, how do you feel about that? And he said, well, it's just something I have to do. It's just the next stage of the journey, and there's nothing to do but to charge into it. And he was like that for the rest of the month that he had in this world. Another time, probably about two weeks later, I, I steered the conversation back around to his impending death just to check in and see how he was doing with that. And he said, I'm not afraid of dying because I know that the Lord has work for me to do. And I thought how typical that my father would sense that meaningful work would be part of the, the, the joy of the life to come. And that, that matter of factness that he had is really how he went the whole way. He was matter of fact that he was dying. And he was just as matter of fact about having full confidence in the Lord and God's powerful and saving love. He never once had a pity party, although he had plenty of opportunity for that. If he had wanted it, he accepted what many would call the indignities of the hospital bed without shame or grumbling. So over those four weeks on hospice, what we had was an 85-year-old man giving a lesson in how to live to his 56-year-old little boy. For one last grand and final time, he set an example for me, and I am so grateful to God and to him, I will never forget it. I mean, I have literally been in awe of him this last month. My father fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. He knew that there was a crown of righteousness reserved for him that the Lord, the righteous judge, would give him on that day, and not only to him, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, the God who is, who was, and is to come at the end of the ages.
Friends, having heard God's word read and proclaimed, it is appropriate for us, even here in the valley of the shadow of death, to stand and boldly, confidently proclaim the faith that gives us hope and that holds us in common. Let us stand and do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us unite our hearts together now in prayer. Let us pray. Let us pray. Living Redeemer, our hope is in you. Accept us as your children in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world from you, was born a human child, and lived among us as one of us. He took the role of a servant and has redeemed us from all sin and death, all fear and alienation. Christ has done this so that we may be his own, live in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and happiness. Since he, being risen from the dead, lives and reigns now forever with you. In this hour of darkness and distress, O Lord, we lift into your loving presence all those who, loving Luke Fant in life, now mourn his passing in death. We grieve as a testimony to your great gift of love that binds us together and sustains us in this life. We know that they grieve the most because they love the most. So enter into the pain and sorrow of this hour, O Lord, and abide with us who are dismayed and pained that we are here today. For we commend Luke Vant, our brother, to you as a good and faithful servant whose spirit bore the fruits of your spirit, humility, kindness, meekness, joy, all the days of his life. So, gracious Lord, here in the valley of the shadow of death, grant us, your children, a full measure of your Spirit, that we might draw on all that we saw and learned and knew in Luke, and so find the strength to celebrate his life and his loving heart. Grant to all of us who mourn a sure and certain confidence in your loving care, that casting all our sorrow on you, we may know the everlasting consolation of your love. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept their f the faith and finished their race, who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially we thank you for Luke Fant, whom you have now received into your presence, for your blessing that kindled in him the love of your name, for his commitment to hard work, to safe roads and clear direction, for his wholehearted dedication to the work of your church and the advancement of your kingdom, for all that he did to magnify the knowledge of your love for all people, for his devotion to his family, for his kindness and generosity for all who knew him, for his many gifts and talents and the spirit he had to share them for all in him that was good and just, gracious and gentle. Our grateful hearts overflow with praise for Luke's good and gracious life that blessed the lives of so many. Draw together now into a community of remembrance all those who keep, respect, honor, and cherish their memories of his life, of those who loved him as husband and father and grandfather, as trusted colleague and neighbor and friend. Help us to remember his spirit and cheerfulness, his kindness, and his abiding love for the tigers. Grant that we might never forget the lessons that he taught us in word and deed and by example 
about faithfulness and responsibility, about passion and optimism and joy and duty and service and vocation. Assist us to hold in our hearts all that we saw in him of the fruits of your Holy Spirit. This was a righteous and faithful life that was free from fear and anxiety, that rendered everything to you in prayer. May we who follow in his footsteps, who follow his example, enter also into the fullness of your glorious presence. Assist us, Lord, to hold in our hearts all that we saw in him of the presence of your love and grace and truth. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks that because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all who believe. So help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years and bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of of your everlasting home. We praise you, O Lord, that one day we may all hear those words that Luke has already heard, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into my kingdom. Our hope is in you, almighty God, that we, being inspired by the example of the faithful before us, may run with patience the course that you have set for us to run, looking always to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith so that when this life is finished, we may be gathered with those whom we have loved in the kingdom of your glory, where there shall be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, for all of those former things will have passed away. Lord, hear all of these prayers that we offer to you this day in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. As we commend Luke Fant now to God's eternal peace and perfect rest, we are comforted by the everlasting and steadfast love of the Lord that never lets us go. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us, his rod and his staff, our constant comfort. Indeed, God has met us here on this beautiful afternoon, but here in our sorrow, with our hearts weighed down by this grief and loss, with the promise that he will never abandon us or forsake us to despair. The Lord joins us here to speak these words of comfort and consolation and hope to our troubled hearts. So blessed be the glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might that is our God's now and forever. For in this place and at this time, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands that is eternal in the heavens. Scripture promises us that if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother, Luke Fant. And we commit his earthly remains to their final resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Christ was the first to rise from the dead, and he promises to raise up our mortal bodies to be like his in glory. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors. Their works follow them. Let us pray. God of boundless compassion, our only sure comfort in distress, look tenderly upon your children, 
Overwhelmed by loss and sorrow, lighten our darkness with your presence. Assure us of your love. Enable us to see beyond this place and time to your eternal kingdom. Promise to all who love you in Christ the Lord. And now, O Lord, support us all the day long. Until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done, then in your mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Fear not, saith the Lord, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.